My name is uh, Juan Jimeno. I am the coordinator of the Inherited Cardiac Disease Unit of the Hospital Universitario Virgen de la Risaca from Murcia, Spain. We are part of the ERN Guard Heart Network. I will talk about the management and therapy of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, management of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy should consider the symptoms like dyspnea, syncope, chest pain, the prevention of uh, complications like arrhythmia, stroke, sudden cardiac death, etc., and also to address recommendations for daily life, sports jobs, genetic counseling, psychological impacts, and pregnancy, etc. I will talk about the first two in management of syndrome prevention of complications, particularly sudden cardiac death. Approximately half of all patients with HCM evaluated in the clinic are asymptomatic. Another half refer symptoms which require treatment and a small proportion from asymptomatic and asymptomatic patients might be at an increased risk of malignant arrhythmias. We as clinicians should be able to treat those with symptoms, stratify risk, and offer preventive options in those at risk. It is important to highlight that this is a genetic disease that developed with life. There is a first phase when the patient has not developed the, the phenotype, then a second phase when the cardiomyopathy appears, but the patient can cope with the disease, and then a third phase of a birth expression with symptomatic imitation. Carriers with should be followed up and clinicians should be aware of the changes that can occur at virtually any age. Obstruction is the most common feature associated with symptoms at risk and risk. We have different therapeutic options to treat it from medication, beta blockers, verapamil, disopyramide, and the new mycin inhibitors alcohol septal ablation to surgical myxomy. A small proportion of patients with HCM below 10% progress to wall thinning, left ventricular dilatation and systolic impairment. In those patients, vasodilators, diuretics, and all the heart failure therapies are momentary and would be considered. We have fewer options for those who develop severe diastolic dysfunction. The small ventricles do not cope well with left ventricular filling restriction. End diastolic pressure increases and retrograde pulmonary pressure as well. Those are the most difficult to manage and some of them end up undergoing heart transplant. It is important to consider all available clinical information in order to identify chronotropic incompetence, which can be a common limiting factor of cardiac output. Evaluate the presence of arrhythmias and valvular disease as well. Echocardiopulmonary exercise test is a valuable tool for evaluation of patients with chronic conditions like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in which patients often adapt their life activities and can minimize their limitations. This test is safe even in severe structured patients. Septal reduction therapy, alcohol septal ablation or surgical myxomy, are recommended in patients with obstruction and functional class 3 or 4, or exceptional syncope when medica medical options fail to improve symptoms. It is very important that the case is discussed in a multidisciplinary team of experts in the field and that the procedure is performed by an experienced operator or surgeons. Despite both procedures have the same level of recommendation, the European guidelines, surgical myxomy is preferred in younger patients, very thick septum, or when mitral valve needs repair. 
alcohol septal ablation can be safely performed in less severe hypertrophy patients. Both procedures can be performed in experienced hands. Surgical myotomy requires a higher level of expertise. The rate of severe complications and death can be as low as 1 to 3%. Surgery has a higher mortality and alcohol ablation is associated, is associated with a higher proportion of need of permanent pacemaker due to AV block. This is an illustrative case of an alcohol septal ablation procedure performed in a 73 years old lady with severe obstruction. In upper images show pre-procedure echocardiograms, bottom videos showing a significant reduction in basal septal thickness and relief of the ventricular outflow tract gradient. And these are the responses on the gradient of the different strategies from disoperamide to surgery. Reduction in gradient is usually maximum with surgical myotomy and lower with classic medication based on combination of beta blockers and verapamil, verapamil and disoperamide. I would like to take the opportunity to present very briefly a new pharmacological agent, which is Mavacapsin, the first of a family of myosin inhibitors. Mavacapsin reduces the number of links between cardiac actin and myosin. This inhibition normalizes the hypercontractility of the thickened heart and also improves relaxation. It has demonstrated a very impressive impact in reduction of left ventricular flow tract gradient and improvement in NYJ class and exercise capacity. There was also a clear cut reduction in NT proof EMP. It is not only a remarkable medication for obstructive patients, but also for non obstructives. There are two recent publications of phase three trials demonstrated this beneficial impact. Regarding obstruction, the reduction in rest in Valsalva and exceptional gradient was seen after a few weeks of treatment and remained stable during follow-up. But the most challenging patients are not always the obstructive ones for whom we can offer different strategies with, with good results. Here I want to show the results of a very elegant study from the Paddock group. 293 patients were follow up for six years. 50, 17% developed progressive heart failure in which a class three, four, leading to admission, death or transplantation. In 30%, heart failure was caused by systolic impairment. 22% had left ventricular flow tract construction, and the majority, 48%, heart failure was due to diastolic dysfunction. There was a female predominance in the heart failure group, and 64% had atrial fibrillation, which was, which not surprisingly was 3.3 times more frequent in the heart failure group. Picture on the right summarizes the natural history of patients with each of the, these three profiles. Half failure patient with obstruction tended to be diagnosed later in life, average 50 years of age. End stage patients had a middle age diagnosis and a slowly progression to transplant or half failure death that occurred 15, 20 years later. Diagnosis in the third group with diastolic dysfunction was around 35 years old with relatively rapid symptomatic deterioration over a 12 year period of time. 
Essentially, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has several phases from obstruction, diastolic dysfunction to systolic failure, and patient can remain stable or evolve. Management of complex cases requires ex expertise and multidisciplinary approach. I wanted to briefly present some concepts on sudden cardiac death prevention. Globally, the most prevalent severe complication is sudden cardiac death, which has an annual rate of 1%. Then have failure death or transplant with a 0.5 and a stroke related death with a 0.1%. Mean age of sudden death cases is around 40s, half failure death around 50s, and stroke related death around 60s to 70s. It is important to know that a stroke can occur virtually at any age and all patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and atrial fibrillation must be anticoagulated, regardless of the child's scores. Traditional risk stratification of sudden death in HCM has been based on individual risk markers syncope and normal blood pressure response during exercise, non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, severe left ventricular hypertrophy, family history of sudden death in a young relative, and severe extraction are variables associated with sudden death risk. The problem with individual variables is that the prevalence of clinical markers is relatively high, around 10% each but the positive predictive value is relatively low. Apart from resuscitative cardiac arrest, no single marker is powerful enough to identify high-risk individuals in whom an ICV should be considered. The most sophisticated tool for risk stratification was produced based on the largest core of HCM patients to date by the London Group. The population consisted of 3,675 patients. There were 198 sudden death cases, that's a 5%, with a calculated 0.8% annual sudden death rate. This proposed score for adult HCM, published in 2014, excluded some variables like abnormal blood pressure response and sex, which was not statistically associated, and included other like left atrial diameter. This complex formula is implemented in an easy online calculator. We can use uh, the a real case in order to, to test the, the tool. This is a 26 years old male presenting with syncopal episode. Echocardiogram showed 30 millimeters maximum left ventricular hypertrophy and a left atrial diameter of 40 millimeters. He had no other risk markers. If we go to the online application, then the estimated sudden cardiac death risk at five years will be 6.03, and an ICD should be considered. ICD should be considered in cases with more than 6% and may be discussed between four and 6%. Patients with an estimated risk below 4% would be considered low risk and safe. This calculator has been very popular since, and most groups have validated and found it useful. Using the more than 4% cutoff for indication of an ICD, 31% of ICD patients would be candidates for ICD implantation. And 71% of deaths could be prevented. 
This calculator was designed for adult ACM patients and doesn't apply for children or for phenocopies like Fabry disease or amyloidosis. Evaluation of sudden death risk in children has always been challenging. A very interesting study recently published has developed an estimation score, which is also available online. In this international multicentric study, 1,024 HCM children with a minimum of 11 years old, 89 died suddenly with an annual rate of 1.5%, which is almost double the rate of sudden death in the core that was uh, used for the model for the adult score. The predictors of sudden death were syncope, non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, maximal left ventricular hypertrophy, left ventricular outflow tract gradient, and left atrial diameter. In the kaplan mayer the curves clearly separated from the cutoff for the cutoff of estimation of 4% and 6% risk of five years. On the right, a very similar rates of observed and predicted five years sudden death risk demonstrating a good accuracy of the model. To conclude, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a, a heterogeneous and dynamic disease. We have therapies, therapeutic tools based on medication and intervention for the management of symptomatic patients. We have learned how to prevent complications, sudden death and stroke. There are some very promising new agent mycin inhibitors that will very likely change the way we approach the disease. Thank you very much for your attention.